Well, welcome back to Texas Scorecard uh, here at the Republican State Convention coming to you live. We've got a conversation with my friend Michael Cloud, who is a conservative congressman, which uh, not every Republican is always conservative. So we always have to remind people that we're, we're letting the conservative ones come to you and talk to you about what's going on in D.C. We are here again at the largest political gathering in the nation. There is we are bigger than the Republican National Convention, the Democrat National Convention, any other state convention. Um, anyways, Michael. Michael, I think a lot of people don't know maybe your backstory. You are somebody who is truly grassroots, came from, at the very beginning, a grassroots oh, yeah. activist to Congress. Why don't you give us just that short story so that people can kind of gain perspective that some people walking around these halls right. could literally be in the halls of Congress, and I think you are you have a unique story in that way. Oh, exactly. All my former experience is completely, completely grassroots, and so I, I came to a convention like this really because I went to vote one day and somebody said, hey, you should go to a precinct convention. I'm like, great, what's that? Uh, and then ended up going to the state convention that year, uh, met some great people, went home, started a young Republican group, uh, ended up becoming county chair. Uh, did that seven years, served on the SRIC for a term, still not even imagining a run for Congress, yep. just trying to do my part, yep. you know, to get people out to vote, to get people educated, to get people motivated, that whole part of uh, you can keep it part of a, a of us being a nation and then, uh you know time came up so people in my district said hey we think you should run for congress and and i was like that seemed like an upper, other people's thing to me but yep. my, my wife and i really prayed about it and felt like it was something we we're supposed to get involved with uh i remember us coming there was a lot of little things along the way uh but i remember us coming to joshua one where god tells joshua he says be strong and courageous mm. and then a couple of verses later he says be strong and courageous and then we get to verse 10 and for a third time, he's saying, haven't I commanded you? Not asked mm -hmm. you, suggested. Haven't mm -hmm. I commanded you to be strong and courageous? It's time. And, and really, we're at a season in our nation where we need people at every level who are mm -hmm. willing to participate with that kind of that kind of courage and gusto, you know, just realizing the moment of history that we're in. So many Texans, I don't think, realize how low the barrier to entry is to start making a difference in state politics. And I think your story really exemplifies that, that you can vote, meet somebody who's maybe a little more engaged, then you end up being a precinct chair, you end up being the county chairman of right. your party, serving on the SREC. We literally just had, about 45 minutes ago, several <laughs> elections for the state Republican Executive Committee, right? Exactly. So we yeah. just had that in this convention with several hundred voters and all these different caucuses, and yet one of those people or one of the people who just walked in for the first time could literally end up walking the halls of Congress, which I think is a testimony to just the Republican Party and the voters we have here in the state. Yeah. So, so you are in Congress. Uh, you are having some very strange interactions with a Democrat-controlled Congress. Uh, you were telling me about a, a very strange committee you had recently. Why don't you tell our voters just how hard the Democrats are working on issues that are facing American voters? Uh, oh, yeah. One, one of the committees I sit on is the Oversight Committee. I'm on the Economic and Consumer Policy Subcommittee. And so we had our first hearing of the year. And so, first of all, red flag number one, that's, and uh, you know. Don't say red flag. Yeah, I realized when I said that. Yeah, that's yeah, the, I, did, I did not mean that in the terms okay, of the Second good. Amendment. No, but, <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes when it comes to uh, the first hearing of the year that they're having on the economic policy committee, uh, and and when you're thinking of okay, it's the economic consumer policy. There's probably some things going through your mind right now. You know, high inflation, high gas prices, food shortage, baby baby food shortage. Even you know, I mean, all these just different things that people are facing. Families having to make the the decision between food or fuel, or you know, what do I do? They literally the agenda item set by the Democrats. Apparently, their number one agenda item for the economic and consumer policy was dog collars, flea and tick collars. You know, uh, I, when I saw my staff hand it to me and say, "This is what they put on the agenda for next yeah. week for a hearing," I literally thought it was a joke. I, I, I you know, it's like <laughs> this is Babylon B, right, or something. But, but no, I mean yeah. that that was uh, le legitimately what, what what they had put on the agenda. Of course, you know, myself and the other Republicans on that we we kept we kept on message about what's important to the American people and said, you know, let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about food prices. Let's talk about gas prices. Let's talk about these policies that are coming out of this White House that are, uh, uh, that are putting such a weight on the families in, in the United States right now. Yeah. When you meet people back home, you come back in Victoria. I mean, how, how many times are you getting talked to about the price of gas and how that's affecting people's 
literal month-to-month budgets right now? Oh, literally, yes. We look at the failed energy policies from this administration, and it has such an outsized impact from the cost of everything that we're dealing with. Okay, yes, the price at the pump is a big, huge part of that, but there's so many, you know, right now I'm also on the Ag Committee, and so you're, you're talking to farmers who cost their fertilizers quadruple. Uh, they can't get pesticides because all of those are byproducts of oil and gas, you know. Your cell phone's a product of oil and gas. You know, so many things we deal with not to mention the shipping and uh, and how that goes into the food prices and everything else going on. Not to mention, right now we have a war going on between Russia and Ukraine because of our failed economic or our failed energy policies. And so, literally, uh, the uh, Biden's policies are are wreaking havoc not just economically, but thousands of lives are being lost because uh, of failed energy policies. It's devastating and. We need a complete reversal. You know, if you study, there was there is an intelligence uh, intelligence council assessment that came out, and this was during the Trump administration. They said the greatest transfer of wealth and power ever in human history is happening right now, uh, going from the Western countries to Eastern countries. They said it was unstoppable. Basically, this march toward globalism cannot be stopped. This was their assessment. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a virtual uns- a virtual certainty is mm-hmm. the terminology they used. But then they said it's happening for two reasons. They said oil and gas revenues are going overseas and manufacturing is going overseas. And so for the last administration, we said, hey, here's a great idea. Let's bring oil and gas revenues back. Let's bring manufacturing back. But the problem is is the elite is so heavily invested in that transition of robbing the American worker of their hard-earned tax-paying dollars and then transferring the wealth and power uh, to nations overseas that don't like us, this this march toward globalism. The the Biden administration has completely bought into it. And uh, so... So that's part of the core reasons of what we're seeing behind the scenes. All these bad policies that we see happening is part of this march toward globalism. One of the things that we hear a lot here, uh, and I know a lot from our viewers and listeners, is a frustration that sometimes when Republicans actually win and take control, they don't do much. We, we tend to not use our control as much as Democrats do. Mm-hmm. With Joe Biden in the White House, if Republicans actually are successful, which it's looking very positive going into November, as long as people continue to actually get out and vote, if we end up taking control of Congress, what is it that voters should be looking to Congress to do? What, the, what should they be expecting from a Republican-controlled mm-hmm. Congress and Senate with Joe Biden as president? Well, one of the conversations I have with other Republican members up there is that we have to shift our paradigm. Because when, when we come into office, we start thinking, what should we be doing? When right now, the, the probably better question is, what should we stop doing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so much of what we're doing at the federal, we have a massively bloated federal government. We are wasting the taxpayer dollar. We are inefficient at so many of the things we we are attempting to do. And, and we've taken, uh, we've shifted the authority uh, mechanism. So the authority is supposed to be vested in the people with a limited government that protects our liberties. Uh, and instead, we're trying to ask the federal government to do and to solve every problem. Uh, and, and there's a role for state government. There's a role for lo- local government. There's a role for churches and families and communities. And each of those, uh, each each of those institutions have a reason to exist. And and we've got to get the federal government back to the constitutional role it was expected to do, uh, which frankly means for us to stop doing a lot of things. Let's stop. S- spending money at the federal level and, and wasting the American taxpayer dollar and get us back to that essential. I've said it before, but the, the, the glory of the American Revolution wasn't a new government. It was a free people. And the free people instituted a government through the Constitution uh, with limited powers to protect and preserve those liberties. Uh, and, and we have to understand that's our first essential function uh, at the federal level. So from a practicality perspective, I just kind of kind of want to break this down so that, again, as voters past November, hopefully Republicans take control. What does that tangibly look like at Congress? Is, right. Does that mean passing yeah. a budget that restricts spending in those areas, sending that to Joe Biden's desk, mm-hmm. doing that numerous times? What What is the tactical implication of that principle? Right. In the, in the short term, in the immediate, we have to realize that every dollar we send to the administration right now is going to bad policies. Mm. So yep. recently, the, there was a massive spending package that passed through the House. 
yep. had a handful of Republican votes, enough to get through. But one of the questions I had asked uh, in conference, one of the things they did was it plussed up DHS, hmm. uh, we, which we're all thinking, yes, we we want our Border Patrol to get raises. We, yep. we want more border security. We definitely need it. But what we also understand is that uh, we've already funded the infrastructure you know, for the wall. We've already funded the wall to be built, but they're actually spending more money to not build the wall hmm. at the border. You know, so we have to understand that whatever we write, you know, we'll send it over and it, and it may say we're plussing up border security, which is yeah. a good thing. But they're going to take those funds and use it for bad stuff, and they're yes. going to use it to continue their human trafficking, basically, well, campaign. Throw, they're throw they're coordinating with the cartels on, on the border or something. Uh, right. Yeah. And so uh, we got to stop funding bad practices as, as a start, yeah. and then we can get back to p putting good practices in, in, in place. But, you know, the next election is really important. Obviously, November is essentially important. It, it can help start the stopping of the bleeding. But we have to realize that November – is as important it is it is and we have to do the hard work to make sure that turns out right uh but but that's the opportunity that's not the solution yeah well michael thank you for joining us today thank you for being here uh again i do think that your story of how you ended up here is really encouraging to anybody walking around to everybody who's watching at home and listening because the reality is that again you could literally be someone who's here for the first time and 10 years later be a congressman um it's a it's a huge testimony and, and praise be to god that he's accomplished <laughs> that thank you for the work that you're doing in congress you're somebody who many of us can look to to know what's going on and actually uh, understand a more conservative perspective of what's happening so we appreciate the work you do oh thank you god bless y'all yeah and uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. We are going to continue to bring you more and more conversations here directly from the Republican State Convention. Stay tuned. God bless.